What's up guys? Welcome back to my channel, JC with Wrong and Strong. And today we're gonna be a little bit on serious no serious note. Serious. Why do I have such a hard time being serious? I don't understand. <laughs> Alright, let's get into this shit. We're talking about Juan Garcia. Only part I'm gonna get into the story real quick. So I was raised most of my life uh, getting sent to Mexico every like summer or whenever I got in trouble. They would send me over there because I, I went to grammar school over there. I did some of my grammar school and I did some of my high school. Um, like literally, like I know the Mexican national anthem and, and like we had to sing it every Monday and like, I was very, very fluent in Spanish for a very long time. And in Chicago, since I practiced it so much, uh, I stayed very fluent. I mean, I was always, you know, the people that I hung out with and stuff. And when I moved to Arizona, I have not practiced my Spanish as much. And it's crazy because it's... It's a border town, you know what I mean? And there's like a shitload of Mexicans here and everything, but it seems like everybody over here is very, very Americanized and like they don't they don't want to speak Spanish and the and the paisas that are here that are just getting here don't want to speak Spanish because they want to learn English. So it's a little fucked up, but yeah, I just thought I'd share that because my I mean as it is, I can't speak, so whatever. Uh alright, let's get into this shit, man. guys what's up JC was wrong strong if you haven't subscribed to my channel subscribe hit the like button share with your friends remember wrong strong is a channel about my life my time in prison um, Mexico uh, I, I share stories about different things the cartels over there pretty much stuff that connects with my life my ups and goes uh, what I do now as a personal trainer, as a motivational speaker, as a author, because I'm working on my second book now. And just what I do, my clothing brand, my nonprofit, when I go to the prisons. Um, just everything in general that has to do with my lifestyle and what I used to do as a learning tool and motivational information. Just to give you guys it pretty much raw 100 percent. this is how i am i know sometimes i can't fucking speak <sighs> i know sometimes i'm like all over the fucking place hey you know that this is me this is jc 100 percent. this is what it is and, and this is how i am so that's what you get if you don't like it uh sign up to like a youtube channel that teaches you how to bake cookies <laughs> all right serious serious all right. After spending nearly 20 years in Supermax prison, Garcia Abrego was transferred to a high security prison. And what I mean by that is that he's probably getting sent to a USP now. A, a USP is you're still behind the wall. That's how you could tell that the security levels in prisons is that if it's a big, big concrete con concrete wall, um, it's pretty high security. So, and then it goes by fences. There, there'll be three fences, four fences, five fences, and then you got the camps that don't have a fucking fence. So, after spending all that time and that AD ADX prison, they're finally moving him to a lower security. Uh, Garcia Abrego is 71 now as the first cartel leader to make the FBI's 10 most wanted list. He was sentenced to 11 life sentences in 90, it was 1997, I remember. It was back in the days so as, a, as a kid, man, I wanted to be a... 
I wanted to be in the cartel. I wanted to be a boss. Uh, I don't want to be no more. <laughs> he was fined $128 million. So the high security prison that he's going to is still in the same like area where ADX is at in Colorado. It's just still it's the same compound. It's just a different uh, not I don't want to say unit, just a different complex. It's like over. Um, the the thing is is that after you've done so much time like that by yourself, like. You, you without a cellmate, without being in general population, it um, it, it could be a pretty big mind fuck. So, it it's gonna be, it's, he's gonna have to get used to it, because the thing is that he he's gonna be able to interact with other inmates now that he didn't before. Um, also he'll possibly have a bunk bed because he'll have a, a cellmate. And too many people don't like that after they've been doing a lot of time in the hole or in solitary confinement. Um, I guess one of the best things for him would be that he doesn't have to walk around shackles or getting escorted by guards no more. That means the gym, the chapel, meals in the dining hall instead of in your cell. Um, the thing that comes with that too now is that now he's going to be in general population. So there's going to be gangs there. But he, he being a high ranking cartel boss he will more likely gravitate towards the gang that uh pretty much i'm pretty sure he there's a gang that his cartel has ties with so i mean he'll be a fucking rock star though that he'll be someone that people want to be with someone that want to spend time with hear stories learn um remember prison you you go in with a GED and you leave out of there sometimes with a PhD and, and, and being a criminal because you hang around with other criminals that teach you stuff uh, and how to do stuff and how to get away with stuff so you know either you could come out really bad again or, or you could get some help um, unlikely unlikely I it's gonna take him some time to get used to it just because of all that all those years that he was in confinement um it's really really hard um it took me about i want to say about a month to really kind of like get used to being around people the noise everything after i was in, in solitary confinement for a while uh because you kind of get used to it you kind of get used to being by yourself you kind of get used to the uh being alone pretty much being in connection with yourself um it was one of the biggest moments where I got to discover myself. I got to really, really dig in deep into my soul and and ask myself if I was going to spend the rest of my life here or if I, this, this, is, this is the route that I wanted to go. I got really, really religious. I started reading the Bible a lot. I started... Uh, meditating a lot i started uh doing a lot of breathing exercises um there was days where it was pretty bad there was days where i had to actually talk to myself look at myself in the mirror just to have that interaction but you know um it, it's a hard it's a hard place to be man and since he did so many years there you know uh uh yeah it's, it's gonna be so who is this guy right well let me tell you, if we start talking about him, we have to go all the way back and talk about his uncle. Uh, I mean, obviously, he was the head of the golf cartel when he got arrested. But if we go way back, uh, his uncle Juan was the AK, the godfather of the Mexican-U.S. border. Uh, he is the founder of the golf cartel. Um... I mean, back in, he started back in the 1930s when he was like smuggling alcohol into the U.S. when the probation thing was happening here. And uh, through, through doing that through so many years, he was able to control all contraband that was going through Rio Grande, like pretty much everything he had his hands on it. So when his uh, nephew, you know, got older, pretty much, you know, um, he, he groomed his nephew to, you know, do do the family business and that's how most of these 
families that are cartels actually work. They groom their, you know, kids, nephews, all these things. I mean, just like El Chapo and his his sons, you know what I mean? They're, they're a different generation. They ha obviously handle stuff different, but they groom them to do these things. And as in time passed by, Juan Avergon's uh, nephew began to utilize all these connections that his uncle had built throughout the years. So when the drug, when the cartel went into the drug business, it was very, very lucrative. It was making a lot of money. His, his uncle, even though he was the founder of the golf cartel, he never spent more than a couple hours in prison. To this day, he it's not documented, nothing. He never went to prison. So that's pretty good. That's pretty good. He actually has a named, uh, a street named after him in Reynosa. Um, his, uh, his nephew, when his nephew came into the business, he's highly, highly known for switch, making that switch from being, because the Mexicans at the border used to just be like the traffickers. So what, what, what used to happen is that the Cali cartel would bring the stuff, right? And they would pay them to cross it over, like per kilo. Well, he sat down and renegotiated everything. So he's widely known for doing that, from becoming, from taking them from being traffickers into suppliers. So they, they took out the middleman and actually started making the real money. He made the deal with the cartel, and this was able, because of this, he was able to secure 50% of all shipments coming out of Colombia. By 1990, he was moving 300 metric tons per year. Do you know how much that is? Do you know how much money that is? Fortune Magazine said he was worth 15 million billion dollars. I should billion dollars. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people are uh, on the payroll. FBI agents, border cops. Uh, a lot of people are on the on the pay on the on the paycheck because when all that money's coming in, it's it's coming in. And I had to make this video because. I got so much shit from when I dropped the Chapel video about why is everybody snitching on El Chapel. And I started getting messages, hey, what about Juan Garcia? He, what about this guy? What about Garcia Abrego? What about him? And it just, it kept on going. Dudes, I could go for a whole year talking about all these dudes because there's so many. There's El Huero Palma, there's, the, I could keep going and going and going and going and going and we'll never finish. So, take a chill pill. Let me go through the process. And I'm gonna say one last thing. Unlikely, like today, many of the captured drug cartel leaders, Garcia Abrego, was fucking old school and he lived by the old school code codes and he did not pursue any deals at the time of his arrest that would have made him get less time he did not share none of his secrets he did not talk a fucking word but remember this guy is from the 70s the 60s he is not from this era he's not from the 90s you know what i mean Different era, different time, different code, and there you go, guys. There's another guy that didn't say shit, didn't open his mouth, he did not cooperate, he told them to go fuck themselves, and he got 11 life sentences. So, it's not worth it. Not worth it. Uh, JC, Wrong Strong, if you haven't subscribed to my channel, Please subscribe, hit the like button, send me some messages, tell me what you think, what you want me to talk about. Remember, keep it, keep it clean, man. Okay? Don't judge nobody. Give somebody a hug and stay in your lane. And remember, wrong or strong is a lifestyle. It is not a quick change. You have to actually do the work to build a habit. And then after you build that habit, it becomes a lifestyle. So, it is what it is, guys. JC, I love you guys. I'll see you soon.